Welcome to the Roadwire Prospect Podcast. I'm your host, James Anderson. And today's episode is going to be the uh, top 400 prospect rankings, uh, kind of recap mailbag episode. Uh, those rankings, of course, went live uh, when or Thursday of last week. And uh, that was that was a lot of work, but it was also a, a ton of fun to kind of get that first update of the season out there. Uh, podcast brought to you by Rival Fantasy, of course, uh, as it always is. Uh, I did want to say, you know, I, I kind of want to apologize to anyone who was trying to get uh, some questions in uh, sort of in the last week plus asking for kind of sneak peek. Like, where is this guy going to rank? Is this guy going to be ahead of this guy on the update? That type of thing. Uh, just in general, like those aren't really going to get answered. Uh, it's It doesn't really help me to take time away from working on the rankings to answer those types of questions. And it, it might not even help you if I were to answer them because it's just I still haven't kind of figured out uh, the answer to some of those questions. So um, patience, uh, patience in the future. Um, but if anything kind of super easy, like yes or no question, I'll, I, I will try to answer. But uh, apologies to the, the people that ask questions like that in the days leading up to the update. Uh, but let's get right into it. Uh, first question uh, this month from Jordan for Giants. Do you use other rankings to help you lay your groundwork and or compare your work? And if so, what other rankings do you look at and respect the most? Uh I, I don't look at other fantasy prospect rankings. Uh, I've, I've never done that. Uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, people that are doing great work out there. Uh, but I, I can't really speak to, to which other rankings are, are the best. Uh, there's just a lot of great people uh, in this space right now. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of research obviously for, for the updates and I use trusted sources uh, public sources like Baseball America and Fangraphs are incredibly important uh, to my to my rankings because that's where I can find stuff that doesn't show up uh, in the stats or the video uh, stuff like you know pitch mix, uh, speed grades, arm strength grades, defensive grades. That stuff is all important and. Uh, I wouldn't be able to, to get a lot of that stuff without uh, the, the great work that's out there. Uh, but no, I, I don't uh, look at other uh, fantasy prospect rankings. Uh, Will Bell, you seemed hesitant to move Jackson Holiday to number one a few weeks ago. And I know it's probably semantics and there isn't much of a difference between being ranked one and three. But what changed your mind? Uh, I think, you know, a few weeks ago. I didn't think there was a clear choice at number one. Holiday was definitely in that mix. And at this point, I, I could go either way on, on Jackson Holiday versus Ellie De La Cruz for number one. Uh, but it is, it is between those two for me. Um, so it, there is a bit of a gap, like from one to three, uh, where Jackson Churio is. Um, you know, Holiday never slowed down, and he. I just kept hearing really great stuff uh, from people that were, were getting eyes on him, uh, especially with regards to his speed, uh, just the fact that he's he's more of a 70-grade runner now. Uh, so he just continues to transform physically. And I ended up settling on Holiday over Ellie De La Cruz uh, because I just think Holiday is a, is a safer bet to be a huge help in all five uh, roto categories. Uh, Ellie has a higher power speed ceiling than really any prospect. <laughs> uh, but I, I think it's possible that he hits maybe 60 points lower in batting average than holiday. Uh, that would be, you know, a, a kind of a lower end outcome for Ellie, but, uh, I always have been a, a hit tool guy. Holiday's hit tool is, is really pretty elite. So, uh, that was kind of the the difference there between Holiday versus Ellie, but <clears throat> I wouldn't argue with anyone who said Ellie was the number one prospect for fantasy. And uh, I could buy a case, you know, especially if you're a contender and you have Jackson Holiday and you can just turn him into Ellie De La Cruz. I would do that. I, I would trade the number one prospect for Ellie De La Cruz, who's number two on my rankings, if I can win my league this year realistically, uh, because I do think we see Ellie probably this week. 
Uh, Brian Johnson, could you throw some major league comps on the top five guys? Uh, interested also in the speed at which you think they can get there. How do these top guys compare to Corbin Carroll uh, slash Gunnar Henderson? And he's thinking kind of along the lines of the Julio Rodriguez Juan Soto comp I uh, made a few years ago. Uh, I, I know people love comps and I, I definitely understand why people love comps, uh, but I don't like using them unless I really believe in them. I, I, I don't like using, you know, 75% type of comps. I just think it's, it's misleading. It's not that helpful. Uh, that's, that's part of why I just took so much issue with people using Julio Rodriguez as a comp for Jordan Walker uh, during the off season. I just, you know, that's such a stretch, especially regarding the hit tool that I just think it's, it's irresponsible and just doesn't help anyone to even say it's like they're, they're kind of close to each other. Um, but maybe that was just, I was lower on Walker's hit tool than, than some people. I'm, I'm not sure, but, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's really tough to come up with a good comp for holiday. Uh, he's, he's too fast to be compared to most of the high OBP types of guys and he has too much potential as a hitter to be compared to most speedsters. So, um, you know, often when you're the number one overall, overall prospect, there isn't a good comp out there for you. Uh, Ellie De La Cruz is is already kind of in the bin of, you know, how it's it'd be irresponsible to kind of compare him to, to too many people. Um, you know, maybe you could say Ellie is is a kind of premium version of like O'Neill Cruz, that type of thing um jackson churio i think it's it's still so early in churio's development and he's been pushed so aggressively uh just the paint is so far from dry on his development that and he hasn't really been at a at a level um where he's playing against his peers so i just think that makes it really tough to to put a comp on a guy because like we know he's incredibly talented but I, I don't necessarily know how the statistical output is going to shake out with, with Churio. I do think his power is his top tool. Uh, I think that's going to be kind of the, the carrier um, for, for Jackson Churio, but um, I, too early to kind of throw out a comp that I feel good about. Uh, Royce Lewis is someone I have comped to Mookie Betts in the past, and I still think that that's in play. And Lewis would have actually been in the mix for – and that you know, very early in the process, I was even considering him for the number one overall spot, if not for the two torn ACLs. Um, so just if if it weren't for Lewis's injury history, uh, he might have ended up being the number one guy. Uh, Alex Washburn, do you think Jackson Holiday keeps up this production? Do you think if he keeps up this production, he could be in in the majors next summer? Uh, absolutely, I think he could be. Uh, I've even heard some people try to make the case that he could be up this year which I don't really buy because of just Jordan Westberg being there, Joey Ortiz being there. Those guys have kind of paid their dues. Um, I, I don't really see them leapfrogging Holiday over those guys. Uh, but I also wouldn't completely rule out Holiday being up in September. Um, but there's a long, long time bef- between now and then. Uh, Cam Anderson says there's a, a huge jump for Junior Caminero. Uh, is is he so good that he gets the Wander Franco treatment from Tampa Bay, or does he get stuck in AAA slash platooning for the first year or so, like Curtis Mead, Kyle Manzardo, Taylor Walls, etc.? Uh, you know, I don't think Mead, Manzardo, Walls. That's that's not like a through line there. I don't think that they're the same for the purpose of this question. Uh, Walls, I think, is is the guy who kind of got the Tampa Bay type of treatment um, where the, the playing time was sort of all over the place. Uh, but, but Meade has played 56 games at double a and 46 games at triple a. So I don't think you could say that Meade's been like held back by Tampa Bay. Uh, he hasn't performed that well when he's been healthy at triple a this year, which is part of why he's hasn't gotten the call, but I don't think there's been sort of some frustrating Tampa Bay thing with Curtis Meade. And I don't think uh, they've held Manzardo back really either. I think he's been pushed uh, as aggressively as any team would have pushed him. 30 games at double A, 45 games at triple A. Uh, so I don't think I don't necessarily buy the exact premise of the question with the, the examples listed there. But 
Uh, I believe Caminero is is in the sort of Mead Manzardo camp where he'll just keep getting pushed at the correct rate. And uh, we saw that with him getting the bump to double A. Um, once he's mastered triple A and he's still not on the 40 man roster, which is essentially kind of where Kyle Manzardo is right now, you could maybe uh, see him be at triple A longer than you think he should be. Uh, but that's kind of more about just how many good players Tampa Bay has. Uh, another part of the reason why Wander Franco got just ne- never really had to fight his way uh, into playing time is because he plays shortstop. Um, so they knew he was their shortstop of the future. So uh, no one was really standing in his way. Whereas these guys who play third base, first base, um, they do have really good options there already. Um, so I think you should be extremely excited about Caminero, um, his long-term potential, but I don't think you should be saying, you know, why isn't he up yet? You know, when we get to this point next year, that type of thing. So, um, he might be a triple A longer than we'd, we'd like, uh, Dandy F chickens, big jump for Emmett Sheehan. When can we expect him in the bigs? Does he have top of the rotation potential? And then Steven Wasilko. Uh, said with the struggles of Noah Syndergaard and Gavin Stone and injuries uh, to Julio Urias and Dustin May, any chance we see Emmett Sheehan this year? And is it stashing season yet for him? Uh, I've been stashing Sheehan in a 16 team uh, league, Rotowire Stake League. Uh, so 16 teams, seven man benches. I've had him uh, stash for a couple weeks just because I think the upside is, is so high. Uh, and I, I wouldn't have him, and to, to Dandy F. Chicken's question, I wouldn't have him ranked in the top 20 as a guy at double A if I didn't think he had top of the rotation upside. Um, so I think given all the injuries the Dodgers have, have already dealt with, it it seems inevitable to me that Sheehan is on a trajectory to get to the big leagues this year. Uh, it would be kind of, um, you, you rarely see a team that's as loaded as the Dodgers add three guys to the 40 man roster at the same position. Like, so they've already added Gavin stone and Bobby Miller to the 40 man roster in season. They'd have to do the same thing with Sheehan. So that aspect of it would be, uh, you know, a little tricky, but I also don't see them letting him sit in the minors all season long. If he's pitching like this, uh, toolsy says I added Brian Wu to one of my teams where I had an opening. I could have gotten him at Sheehan or AJ Smith Shaver. They're gone now. I chose Wu because I thought he had better a better shot for 2023 action. Uh, do you see a big difference in their ceilings? Uh, I do think there's a difference in the in the ceilings um, with Sheehan, Smith Shaver versus Wu. Uh, coming into the season, I think the big question with Sheehan and Smith Shaver was whether they'd throw enough strikes to start. They had uh, frontline caliber stuff, but, but struggled to throw consistent strikes last year. I think they've answered those questions satisfactorily to me, uh, to where I, I just think they're, they're definitely starters long-term. Uh, Wu's fastball is his best pitch and it's, it's probably a, a 70 grade pitch, but you know, Sheehan's fastball is an, an 80 grade pitch. And then I, I think I'd probably take Sheehan's change up and Smith Shaver's slider over Wu's slider. Uh, so I think Wu's upside is more of kind of like a, a number two. And then the other two, I, I would say they do have kind of front of the rotation upside. Uh, and then Ryan Keller said, following Brandon Fott's struggles with command in the majors, it would be helpful to compare him to some of the breakout arms ranked within close proximity, specifically Emmett Sheehan and AJ Smith Shaver, and the reasons you have to still be optimistic on his potential. Um, so Fott, Fott didn't have a down arrow next to his name on this update uh, because so many guys ahead of him graduated, but he, he essentially moved down. Like he didn't, he didn't stay in place. Uh, he just doesn't have the down arrow because so many guys in front of him graduated. Um, so I'm, I'm slightly less optimistic long-term on Fott than I was before the season. And he's not helping anyone right now, which I thought he would be. A, that was part of the appeal to me with Fott is that this was someone that you'd, you'd be able to use uh, all season, essentially, maybe not the first few weeks, but uh, for the majority of the season. So you're not, be- you're not able to use him right now. Uh, so I'm reacting to his struggles 
I don't want to overreact to his struggles. Uh, I think, you know, you know, I ranked Smith Schauber number 31 overall. Uh, but that was when I thought we might see him around late June or early July. And now that he's already up, I think I would move him over Fott. So I think Fott would be third behind Sheehan and, and Shaver of, of the guys you mentioned. And then Sheehan ranks eight slots higher than Fott, which might not seem like much, but that is a decent amount when we're talking about guys inside the top 30. Uh Sheehan and Smith Shaver definitely have better fastballs than Fott. That's that's pretty obvious. Uh, Fott's slider is is arguably the best secondary offering of the trio. Uh, I still think he'll have better command uh, than Sheehan and, and Smith Shaver long term. Um, you know, if if he were pitching at the levels those guys have pitched at this season, I think his numbers would be insane as well. Uh, so I I'm sure you're not alone in questioning why. I didn't tank Fott's ranking, um, but to me, that's that's actually a sign that there's an opportunity here to buy the dip on Fott. Uh, you know, pitching prospect development is is almost never linear, uh, so I I still have faith in Fott uh, long term, uh, being kind of like a number two uh, starter uh, when all the pieces sort of add up, but. Uh, less confident in him than I was before the season. And obviously the fact he's not helping you right now uh, was not something I, I saw coming. Uh, Travis Pastor, uh, Pastore uh, seems like there's a lot of pitchers who've made cases for climbing the ranks. What are you looking for when it comes to guys that seem to catch fire like AJ Smith Shaver? So with Smith Shaver, uh, you know, we love it. We love it when pitching prospects or any prospect, but uh, we love it when guys climb multiple levels in the minors over the course of a full season. But he went from high A to triple A in six weeks, and he, now he's in the majors. You know, that type of ascent, especially in a great organization for a pitcher uh, with at his age, uh, with two potential 70-grade pitches in the fastball and the slider, uh, I think you got to take that very seriously. Um you rarely, rarely see a pitcher that age moved that quickly from high A to the majors. So uh, that was a, a clear sign to me before he got the call that this is a guy that uh, needed to be taken very seriously. All right, so going to head to a, a quick break, a uh, message from the sponsors, and then we come back, I will answer some questions about Xavier Isaac. A new MLB season means it's time for a new kind of daily fantasy baseball. Rival Fantasy is the fantasy platform reinventing the way daily and weekly games are played, and they've brought new games to the ballpark this year that fantasy players won't find anywhere else. Rival Fantasy's games include Fantasy Bingo, Head-to-Head -head Player Challenges, and Fantasy Book, where users can select over-unders for two to five players. With games like this, daily fantasy has never been better. Right now, Rotowire listeners can get a $50 protected first play, that means if you win your first play, you keep your winnings. But if you lose your first entry, Rival Fantasy will fully refund you up to 50 bucks. Go to play.rivalfantasy.com slash sign up and use code Rotowire MLB at sign up and deposit a minimum of $25 to get your first entry on Rival protected up to $50. Now's the time to step up to the plate and become a rival today. Welcome to the arena. Okay, so we're back. Uh, O's Flow said, can you elaborate on Xavier Isaac's double up arrows? Plate discipline numbers are elite, but power's not showing up yet. And then Pope George Ringo II asked, what caused Xavier Isaac's rise in the last update? His plate skills so far this season look good, and I know he's still very young, but for a guy whose calling card is supposed to be his monumental power, it really hasn't shown up yet. So uh, Isaac, uh, who I ranked inside my top 60, is he's my favorite healthy teenage hitter at single a right now uh i wanted to stress that in my rankings that like his monster raw power it's it was well known coming into the year it's obvious if you watch him uh, hit a home run uh, so the, the raw power is not up for debate um but you never know how a prep hitters hit tool will translate in pro ball uh, what he's showing, what, what Isaac is showing right now from a pitch selection standpoint is, is just the main thing for me. He's answering that question. 
Uh, in the month of May, he hit 289, 449, 605 with three home runs and five strikeouts in 12 games. So, I mean, the power's been there in May, uh, and we just didn't know how the hit tool would translate. And it's now we know it's translating very well at an age appropriate level. Um, so I wanted to stress that on my update. I think this is a potential star cleanup hitter long term. He's showing me everything I wanted to see. I do have a comp for Xavier Isaac. I, I see a lot of Ryan Howard in Xavier Isaac uh, long term. So I think he's a potential you know top three fantasy first baseman. Uh, it's going to be a while. Obviously, we talked about uh, the log jam with guys like Junior Caminero and uh, Kyle Manzardo, Curtis Mead. So it's it's maybe not going to be easy whenever he's ready to to find a clear spot for him to play every day. But once he's playing every day in the big leagues, I, I think Xavier Isaac's just going to be a monster. Uh, Joe McHugh asks, is there long-term concern about Gabriel Gonzalez not getting to power or that he's not at high A yet with the K minus walk and the, uh, or the K to walk rate, I should say, and the other offensive stats thought he'd be a riser. So Gonzalez's ability to make contact is is excellent, uh, or at least appears to be excellent against single A pitching. But he's he's repeating that level. Uh, he's not a good athlete. He doesn't have a great body. Um, you're hoping for plus hit and plus power, I think, with Gonzalez, and he has he has a chance to be that guy. We know that. Uh, just based on like the exit velocities, we know that he has a chance to have at least plus game power. Uh, but we're we're still talking a few years down the road there uh, with Gonzalez and the lack of speed. Um, like I know he's stolen some bases, but he's a 40 grade runner, uh, according to both Fangraphs and Baseball America. And he's got this really aggressive approach right now, so he can he can make contact with with almost any pitch, uh, but he's probably swinging at too many pitches right now. So we don't know, is, is he going to maximize his raw power in games? Um, so the, you know, all that stuff, the aggressive approach, the lack of speed, the not a good athlete part, I'm just kind of taking my time moving him up the ranks, at least until he does it at a new level. Uh, now, when he gets to high A, that's, that's a, a advantageous hitting environment for, for the Mariners at Everett. But um uh, I'd like to see him, you know, kind of carry over this success uh, at a new level before giving him, you know, a notable bump. Um, all right. The fair poll asks, did you play baseball growing up? And if so, what kind of skill set did you have? Uh, so I played baseball uh, through middle school. I was a pole hitting second baseman. I never hit an over the fence home run. And I could never figure out how to hit the ball to the opposite field on purpose. Uh, I was aggressive on the bases and I was also good at tagging out uh, would be base stealers at second base. Um, probably the rest of my defensive skills were fringe average. I would say uh, none of my good friends played baseball in high school. So I kind of gave it up at that point. Uh, I've always regretted that decision, but you know, it is what is what it is. Um, but yeah, I, I played baseball. Um, played baseball pretty much nonstop from, uh, you know, early early elementary school through middle school. Uh, lots of fun, like uh, games at, at like parks by my house growing up with with kids when I was in elementary school. Uh, Joey DeClerc says, uh, "No line Richardson suggests you're one of the lowest on him. What do you need to see for him to rise up the rankings?" So. Richardson's absence was actually an oversight. Uh, I knew I needed to add him, but I forgot to mark him. Uh, like I have a whole sort of lengthy process of kind of pinpointing guys that I'm going to add. And he just, he slipped through the cracks when I was adding those guys in. Uh, that's totally my fault. Um, but I, I still think there's significant relief risk. He's not going deep into games right now. Uh, he would have probably been in like the, you know, I don't know. He would have been like low two hundreds, maybe around like 300, 320, that type of thing. So uh, not the end of the world, in my opinion, if you dropped Lion Richardson, cause you saw he wasn't ranked, but he was supposed to be ranked. So um, I didn't, didn't purposely leave Lion Richardson off. 
Uh, Chris Marr says two years ago, the Giants had a hot system with Marco Luciano, Hunter Bishop, Luis Matos, Helio Ramos, Jairo Pomeres, etc. What the hell happened? Any idea on Matos ETA and what the what fantasy production to expect and why the Averson Artiega ranking plummet? Okay, so uh, I think we'll probably see Matos in the majors this summer since he's on the 40 man roster already. Um, but it might it might not be a situation where he's up for good. They might uh, bring him up when there's sort of a an advantageous set of pitching matchups coming up for him and then maybe send him right back down. We, we've seen them do that with, uh, you know, Helio Ramos in the past. Uh, you know, we saw like the Dodgers do that with James Outman last year. Uh, maybe he'll be up for good, especially if he performs really well. Um, now I, yeah, so I, I think we could see him. I don't think he's necessarily going to move the needle a ton this year. Um, he's already, you know, he came into the year, stock was way down, um, and then he, he has already forced one promotion to AAA. I think they should leave him at AAA for a while. Um, I think that would probably be best for his development, but uh, I do think we'll probably see him at some point. Uh, Luciano's back issues, uh, much like Brendan Davis of the Cubs, uh, they've, they've really kind of affected him. I think that that's pretty clear. Uh, Bishop's injuries have also contributed significantly to him uh, not living up to expectations, but I think that the hit tools with Luciano and Bishop just were worse than than anticipated. I think even before those guys uh, got hurt and injuries kind of slowed them down. Um, the Giants have drafted pretty poorly over the past five years or so. I think that's showing up. Um, Ramos was Helio Ramos was probably never as good of a prospect as many thought back at the peak of his value. Uh, I think he just, he kind of had this sort of, um, you know, young for his class. The tools were kind of always, I think oversold, um, you know, the speed especially was, was sort of oversold. Um, so I think he, he was probably overranked and then he just kind of hit a wall. Like a lot of guys do when they get to the upper levels, uh, Pomeris, I think has, has fallen in love with the, with his power, um, as he's grown into it to the, at the expense of, of contact. And then to the Artiega uh, question, you know, he's been, if you look at everything he's done and add it up, like since he's gotten a full season ball, uh, he's been a below league average hitter, um, uh, in 165 games and the, the great teenage hitters, in my experience, they don't tread water in a ball, which uh, Artega is doing. I think that, you know, the great ones usually uh, just don't really face much resistance at, at single A or high A. Uh, but he's, you know, he's still ranked due to his power, his speed, his defense. Uh, but it's not a statistical track record that even screams that he like needs to be ranked. Uh, he's got a 33.7% hard hit rate, which is great, but he's also got a terrible 30.2% soft hit rate. Um, so not, not very consistent in terms of the quality of his contact right now. Uh, Finney, I vaguely recall hearing that hitters in the lower minors struggle against plus changeups the most because they're rare. If this is true, could it help explain Gavin Stone's issues this year at AAA and in the big leagues? So Stone, uh, you know, he dominated at even the highest levels of the minors prior to this year. So, it's you know it's not like he was just on fire at high a and then he got up to double a or triple a and they they solved him um but i do think you're on to something kind of in general um uh, pitchers without high end velocity or a high end breaking ball have a much smaller margin for error especially when it comes to like you know if you're not commanding your pitches and i, I you know this is the worst command that stone's ever shown uh, both at triple a and the big leagues and i you know i don't know if it's maybe he doesn't have the confidence to throw his fastball in the zone uh maybe he's just having a hard time putting the pitch where he wants either way it, it's not good uh being a starting pitcher in the big leagues is it's so mental and uh, that's what i think makes a guy like uri perez so uh, remarkable 
is that he's he's handling it at, at such a young age uh and i think i think stone is just struggling with with all aspects of things right now I, you know he might be pitching scared uh so i i'm fairly worried about stone um tough I, i'm more confident in fought kind of putting it all together in the coming months than i am with stone and uh I didn't really know where to rank stone on this update. Um, we'll see how he does between now and the next update, but uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a little iffy uh, shades of shades of Jackson Cower, dare I say. Um, but uh, hopefully not. Uh, Finney said, I've heard some people reference the Midwest leagues, awful weather attributing to Jackson Merrill's struggles. Do you see anything else going on there? He was boldly predicted by some to potentially be number one overall by year's end. Uh, I just think he's been way too aggressive and he still hasn't solved his ground ball issues. Uh, in general, you can throw out uh, April for the Midwest League uh, when it comes to power output especially. But I don't think uh, cold weather is necessarily to blame for Merrill's aggressiveness or launch angle. I think those are things that he does need to work on a little bit. Uh, Finney also asks, uh, Dalton rushing seems like the real deal, but limited and blocked at as a catcher. They've been trying to trying his glove elsewhere, but what real expectation can we have for his arrival, uh, his ETA? Uh, so I think the Dodgers you know, is kind of complicated because they have Diego Cartaya at double A. And I think even they would tell you that rushing has kind of, well, I, I don't know if they would tell you, but I, I would assume they would tell you that rushing is past Cartaya on the organizational depth chart. Uh, but, you know, rushing still at high a he doesn't he's not really learning much at high a right now he probably should be at double a but cartaya being there kind of complicates that uh, maybe rushing is up in the middle of next year uh he's you know he's not just blocked a catcher he's blocked at first base too um but there there should be enough starts to go around at designated hitter and backup catcher for him to play plenty uh once they decide to start his clock but uh, just not not a, not a guy that uh, I think they'll be rushing to the majors. Uh, that was really bad. Uh, Doug Blasinski says Connor Norby seems to be falling in the Baltimore system, but stays higher in your rankings. What do you see? He also says Josue DePaula would appear to either skyrocket or fall quickly when he comes to play this summer. Uh, true? Question mark. So you know Norby went from 34 on my rankings to 40 while close to a dozen guys graduated ahead of him. So he, he definitely fell on this update as Jordan Westberg uh, shot past him. Um, but, I, you know, Norby's still a good prospect. He's got a, like an 850 OPS <clears throat> in his last 28 games. Uh, so uh, Norby's a good prospect. He's slipped a little bit, but I think he's still a top 50 prospect. Uh, the expectations for DePaula – will be to dominate in the Arizona Complex League, which opens June 5th. Uh, th those are my expectations. Uh, my, my next update will be uh, after the draft in late July. So he'll have about six weeks of games before then. Uh, if he's striking out more than expected, he'll definitely be a faller. But if he lives up to expectations, he'll get a big bump. So... I think Doug is, I think you're right on there with DePaula. I mean, there's a, you know, there's a scenario where he just kind of stays around where he is. If he's just sort of, you know, like 120 WRC plus with like a 22% strikeout rate or something like that. Um, Stefan Wasilko says, I was hoping one of Miguel Blaise, Sam Wells, Avala, or Josue DePaula could vault to the top by season's end like Jackson Churio last year, but it seems like all have started out slowly in particular to Paula thoughts on all going forward. Uh, to Paula is not playing yet. So, um, you know, he hasn't started off slowly. He just isn't playing yet. The, the Arizona complex league starts June 5th. I will be previewing uh, the rookie leagues uh, next week's pod. Uh, Zavala has been great in my opinion. 
Um, but he doesn't, he doesn't have like Sam, Samuel Zavala doesn't have Jackson Churio's uh, power speed ceiling. Zavala is more sort of high hit tool, high OBP. Uh, Blaze is, it's looking like it's going to be like a slower burn with, with Miguel Blaze. So uh, still extremely talented, but it's not just all clicked for him immediately like it did with uh, Churio seemingly. All right. Toolsy. Uh, Jonathan Classe or Miguel Blaise if ETA wasn't as important. Uh, he said he added Blaise this year, recognizing he was all projection and saw the aggressive Fangraphs rating. Uh, Classe for me uh, because he's performed well against more advanced pitching. So he's a safer bet than Blaise and has a, a similar ceiling. So when whenever I get a question like that, that's like throw out the ETA, who's better? it's often still going to be the guy who has the better ETA because they've proven more. Uh, they've established their skill level against a better caliber of, of pitcher. <clears throat> All right. Finney asks how much stock can we put into Jonathan Classe's power numbers? And then uh, Ryan Keller says Jonathan Classe has been one of the fastest risers in prospect rankings since the beginning of the year. How real is his ability to hit for power and for a high average? Uh, how do you see that projecting once he reaches the majors? Is he a potential top 10 prospect? So I think we're still kind of in the, the feeling out phase with Class A. Uh, his two best performances were in the Dominican Summer League, which is extremely hitter friendly, and at High A Everett, which is a favorable home park. Uh, he's young for double A, but he's not so young that I think we can just look past the 34% strikeout rate. Uh, I was probably too low on class A coming into the year. And we've seen with guys like uh, Jorge Mateo and Asturi Ruiz that it can be good to be patient with these Supreme speedsters. Uh, they can sometimes take a while to kind of fully turn into uh, everyday big leaguers. Um, but I don't think the I don't think the hit tool will ever be good enough with Class A for him to be a top ten prospect on my rankings. Uh, but we'll we'll see. You know he could uh, turn things around pretty quickly. A lot of season left. Uh, Scott Corlander says, "What's Blaze Jordan got to do?" Uh, I really like Blaze Jordan uh, for what he is, and he's got double up arrows. He's inside the top one hundred. Uh, I generally think Blaze Jordan's underrated. Uh, so maybe we agree about the player and we just disagree about where he should be slotted. Uh, but he's, you know, he's essentially a designated hitter who may or may not walk at a typical DH caliber clip. Uh, if I knew that Blaze Jordan would be uh, good enough defensively at first base or third base, uh, he'd probably be 50 spots higher, but he has zero margin for error offensively. And he's still never faced double A pitching. Uh, so I feel like uh, I, Blaze Jordan has done everything kind of in his power offensively, other than walk a lot uh, to, to move up the rankings. It's just kind of this, you know, DH profile for a guy that age. I mean, he's physically ma maxed out. Um, probably my bet for the biggest uh, hat size in minor league baseball, Blaze Jordan. Uh, O's flows. How concerned are you about early MLB struggles from Brandon Fott and Grayson Rodriguez? Is this the return of Tin Step? Uh, Tin Step, of course, the very long acronym of there is no such thing as a pitching prospect. Uh, Tin Step didn't go anywhere. And I think this just kind of gives more credence to my general rule about not ranking pitching prospects with zero MLB success in the top 15. Uh, I expect Fott and Rodriguez to be fine long term if they stay or if they have relative good health. But uh, just kind of another in a very long line of examples why you should not uh, go all in on whoever you think the best pitcher in the minor leagues is. Uh, J Ship D says Dylan Dingler off because of age and no expectation of carrying over to majors question mark and then cody martin dylan dingler versus andrew cassetti of the twins why does one guy slide in and the other slide out age to level proximity performance 
Uh, Dingler didn't slide out. Dingler hasn't been ranked since September of 2021. And if you're ever, uh, if you're ever curious about where I've had a guy ranked in the past, you can see the the graph on their, their player page. Uh, that'll, it's about like halfway down everyone's player page. It shows where a guy's been ranked. Um, so yeah, Dingler didn't come off the, the rankings. Uh, part of the thing with the catcher renaissance, it, I did almost put Dingler back on though. Uh, part of the thing with the catcher renaissance is with a guy like Dingler, you know, I just can't project a guy like that to be a top 15 catcher really ever in, in a batting average league. Uh, he's what, like 24 at double a striking out a ton. Um, if you're in a, if you're in a deeper two catcher league, then Dingler should be rostered by someone. Uh, but I just don't think he's very exciting. Like I've, you know, I've got like how many catching prospects are better than Dylan Dingler, like 20, um, 15 so add that to the catchers in the big leagues and it's just like what are we doing ranking the 35th best catcher for dynasty like i, I don't really want to do that um and he's not going to debut probably until he's 25 next year uh john Vaghi, uh judd fabian's hard hit rates aren't great is this cause for worry uh they're not ideal uh, we know that fabian's got the raw power, but he's made a, a lot of weak contact this year as well. Uh, 25% soft hit rate, 37% infield fly ball rate. Uh, the overall performance and the tools to me still warrant a top 200 ranking, but he, he's trending slightly down. Uh, Alex Washburn says, if you could roster one of Judd Fabian, Dylan Beavers, or Samuel Basalo in a OBP league, who would you choose? I would take Basalo. He's just a more impressive overall hitter to me, uh, all things considered. And he's not walking a ton, but he's also four years younger than Fabian and three years younger than Beavers. So I just think Basalo's trending towards being a, a more impactful hitter. Uh, J-Ship D, uh, does the uncertainty of performance of FYPD guys like Drew Jones ever make you question the value of ranking them at all until some sample size exists in Pro Bowl? Uh, no. Uh, I, I have generally always thought that people are too quick to jump on amateurs in open universe leagues, and I think many people overvalue uh, first-year player draft picks. Uh, but those guys have to be ranked when they sign. Uh, they just they just have to be. Uh, was you know was there no value in ranking Jackson Holiday number fifteen overall when he signed? Like you know I think there there is value. Uh, we're gonna be wrong about uh, the guys. The less sample size we have, especially of zero, uh, that's where you can really get into trouble with how high you rank a guy. Uh, but I, you know there's there's never gonna be a world where I don't rank guys like that uh, until they debut. Uh, Robert McGoldrick says, what is going on with Drew Jones? He looked totally overmatched in April, injured his hamstring six weeks ago, and has now disappeared. Seems injury was an excuse to give him a reset and extend his spring training, and I anticipate he will get the start in rookie ball he missed last year. Uh, I think it seems like you got a pretty good read on things, Robert. Uh, I'm going to preach patience with Drew Jones. It was a clear mistake to take him over Jackson holiday uh, and to rank him over Jackson holiday. I did have them right next to each other, but still, you know, I don't really think the process was wrong there. Uh, the results have borne out that holiday should have been the, the top guy for sure. Um, but I think Jones's physical tools and his track record as an amateur are still more important to me than what he did in 10 games as a pro before the injury. So, uh, and it's not like he was in the sort of like Elijah green danger zone, like 45% strikeout rate type of thing. Um, so I'd preach, preach patience with Drew Jones, but uh, I know, I know some people just aren't very patient. <clears throat> uh, toolsy, asks uh i bought emmanuel rodriguez this year and now i am concerned are you expecting him to rebound uh 
he's got a, a 26% strikeout rate over his last 10 games. So he, he, he might be gradually rebounding. Um, and I, I wouldn't have kept him in the top 100 if I was just terrified by what we've seen in this small sample. Um, I mean, you knew about the strikeout risk with Rodriguez coming in. Um, and he, yeah, like I said, he's, he's showing signs. Uh, Chris Valenci, thoughts on Gunnar Henderson? He's really been struggling, hitting the ball hard, uh, lists a bunch of stats. Uh, is he a buy low in Dynasty or some concerns? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he got sent down to AAA, given the O's have lots of options. Uh, I'd still be pretty surprised if they sent him to AAA. Uh, I don't know if he's a good buy low. I mean, that just depends on your league and who has him currently in your league and how they're valuing him. Uh, I, you know, you're, <laughs> this is not a, not a good time to be trading Gunnar Henderson. I don't think, um, I do, you know, I like that his walk rate is trending down. <laughs> How often do we say that about a, a young hitter? But I think with Gunnar, it's actually true. Uh, there was a time earlier this season where he was walking or striking out in over 50% of his plate appearances. And that's just not going to lead to much production. I think he had, I get like four RBI after like the first month or something like that. Um, so I, I like that he's walking less. He's putting more balls in play. I think that's good. Uh, I, I, you know, he wasn't the super special type of prospect that uh, Corbin Carroll was. There just wasn't, in my opinion, a good option to rank second other than Gunnar Henderson, especially since we saw him have success in the majors already. Um, but I mean, Carroll was, was the clear top guy. Um, and Henderson was probably eh, like a, a weaker number two overall prospect probably. Um, but he had also had success in the big leagues, you know, not, that's not always the case for the, the number two overall prospect coming into the year. Um, so there, there's been some growing pains with Gunner. But I could definitely see myself loading up on Henderson in, in redraft next year. Uh, we'll just we'll kind of see how he does over the rest of the season. I think he, you know, I think a year from now, the idea of sort of panicking over Gunnar Henderson, I, I think, will look uh, pretty silly. Uh, Danny J, you are the high man on Jared Jones. Uh, what do you see? Uh, Jared Jones of the Pirates, uh, elite stuff with improving command and control. Uh, he was kind of in that same, you know, Emma Sheehan, AJ Smith, Shaver, Ben coming into the year of guys with monster stuff uh, and bullpen risk due to the inability to consistently throw strikes. Uh, he probably had even more reliever risk than those two coming into the year. Um, so that, you know, he's not, he's not up by those guys in like the top 30, but, uh, I, I think, I think he's breaking out in just kind of a less buzzy way. Uh, if he can limit the walks, really just kind of keep the walk rate around like 9%, uh, at double a where he's you know younger than most, uh, high end pitching prospects. Uh, he just has absolutely, you know, frontline type of stuff with the the fastball and the slider uh, he might not be a, a number one starter but uh, he's going to miss a ton of bats especially if he keeps uh, improving uh, on the command uh, reed de salvo if yankeel fernandez developed any type of ability to draw a walk how high would he shoot up the board uh, there aren't any qu there aren't any questions to me about the power with Fernandez. Uh, I'm sure Reed agrees there, uh, but he is absolutely allergic to taking a walk, and he's going to have to stay on top of his conditioning to remain a viable outfielder. Uh, there's a chance he even ends up at at designated hitter. Uh, we'll see. Um, but uh, you know, also Spokane is just really going to inflate numbers. So I think mean, you've seen that kind of across that roster. We sort of previewed that coming into the season uh, on the pod with Sam Dykstra, just how loaded that Spokane roster was, but you have to be careful with the stats because they're going to be really uh, outrageous. So like, you know, going from super aggressive to patient 
that's just not really realistic. That doesn't usually happen, especially not quickly. But yeah, he'd, he'd probably end up in the top 50 if you could magically give him a better approach. Uh, Bad Prospect Ranks says, on your podcast with Ross Jensen, you made it seem like Chase Mydroth versus Nick York was an interesting conversational topic. Equating their valuations roughly, you picked York over Mydroth, which makes sense, but given their roughly equivalent performances, how come there's a 280-spot gap? Uh, I did think it was a in- interesting conversational topic, as you said, uh, given that they're both bad defenders who kind of play the same positions. Um, but I never really thought it was that close from a value standpoint. I, I definitely apologize if I phrase something poorly in the conversation with Ross. Uh, you know, and he mentioned Mydroth as like an underrated guy. Uh, and I, I just thought it was fun comparing the two, but, uh, and I, I touched on the two in a, in a mailbag about a month ago and explained partly why I prefer York. Uh, he got <clears throat> 10 times the signing bonus that, that my got. So they're, they're much more invested in him and York is nine months younger and his hit for significantly more power. So, uh, I stand by the rankings and I apologize if, that podcast sort of made it seem like my draft was going to be ranked up by York. Uh, that was not my intention, but didn't have time to go back and listen to that. But apologies if I misled you there. Uh, Travis Pastore. <clears throat> I know he may not be a prospect anymore, but since he's in the minors, how has this season impacted Vaughn Grissom? Uh, it's been a bad year for Grissom's value. He doesn't seem to have a clear future with Atlanta due to his inability to play shortstop and his defense uh, could be affecting his offense at this point. You know, like I'm sure he, <clears throat> I'm sure in his mind, he was going to be the, the everyday shortstop for Atlanta this year. And uh, the amount of time and stress he's kind of put on improving his defense, he might be taking that to the plate with him. Uh, I don't think you should panic drop him or anything in, in a dynasty league, but just the, the, the harsh reality with Vaughn Grissom <clears throat> is he, he probably needs a trade or Ozzy Albies to get injured in order to start providing positive fantasy value. And there's just, there's zero guarantee that Atlanta is actually going to trade him anytime soon. So uh, just kind of a holding pattern type of situation with Grissom. Uh, these, these things usually figure themselves out in you know it's i don't think it's gonna be like two years before grissom's found a way to be playing every day but you just got to be patient there and, and hope he gets traded uh breadman says josh young versus royce lewis uh this is really tough uh i love both guys uh young kind of seems to be on the austin riley path of gradual skill improvement and route to being a top three or top five fantasy third baseman at his peak. And uh, I've said many times that my only concern really with Royce Lewis is keeping that knee healthy. So I kind of look at Lewis as like at his peak, he could be like a 275 hitter who goes 25, 25, and then Young, like at his peak, he could be maybe a, a 290 hitter with 30 plus home runs. So I, I'm very high on both guys. I'm going to say Josh Young, uh, just since he's more of a sure thing. But I do think Lewis has a, a slightly higher ceiling. Uh, Michael Thomas, any signs Justin Dearden gets his K percentage down closer to 25%? Uh, not really. Dearden did he did almost all his damage this year in a early May series against Albuquerque, and he'd be ranked a little lower if I was updating things today. I think I, I think I overranked Dearden on the the update. Michael Thomas, what happened to Mason Hour? Uh, he just ran into a wall against Double A pitching. A forty three percent strikeout rate in May. Massive red flag. Uh, he's still one of the best athletes in the minors, but that just happens sometimes, guys. 
they keep climbing, they keep making enough contact, they keep climbing, they make enough contact, and then they get to a level. The jump from high A to double A is huge, and I think he just got to a level where he's just he's just overmatched. So uh, that's that's enough of a red flag where I pretty much you know I, I dropped Mason I dropped Mason Hour in a league where like 250 prospects are rostered. I dropped him in April uh, because his strikeout rate was just in such a danger zone to me. Eric Wagner, uh, you added Aaron Schunk to your rankings in the 200s. He's going to be 26 in July and has a nearly 30% K rate. In what sort of scenario do you add a player like this? Uh, I think Eric, I think you've been a subscriber for a while, but I, I used to love Shunk a few years ago. Uh, I liked him coming out of the draft. I liked him uh, after his pro debut, uh, but he just completely fell flat at high A as a 23 year old. Uh, I think the Rocky, either the Rockies or Shunk, they were trying to kind of incorporate some adjustments that just didn't really take and just kind of led to him having an awful year that year at high a, uh, but he, he showed signs of improvement last year. <clears throat> he made uh, more contact, started walking more, <clears throat> even after getting the bump to double a. And uh, you know, he's part, he, he's partially used the, the advantageous conditions of the Pacific coast league to put up big numbers this year. So, I understand why you would be sort of skeptical of adding a guy like this, but you know, he's a solid defensive third baseman. He can play some second base. Uh, I think there's, I think there's reason to, to kind of sort of see where this goes. Uh, if he, if he had already spent a year at triple a and was repeating the level, I'd be less open to the idea of him figuring something out that could carry over to big league success. Uh, so he, he is kind of towing that line of, you know, is this going to play in the majors or is this sort of a quad a guy, but uh, you know, my, I've, I've liked, he might not have been ranked if I just was never an Aaron Shunk guy, but I, I was a, a pretty big Aaron Shunk guy and I uh, just kind of want to see where this goes. And I think he's, he's struck out less and hit for even more power probably than, than when you asked this question. Uh, T O double D uh Best hitter and best pitcher to be called up going forward. Uh, two pretty easy calls here. Uh, Gavin Williams for the pitcher, Ellie De La Cruz for the hitter. John Vaghi says Lawrence Butler looks like a different player. Was there a swing change here? Uh, can we trust the 77% contact rate uh, plus closer to a 20% K rather than 30 going forward? How's the defense? Yeah, Butler just, uh, you know, he's he's really been trending up over close to, you know, over the past like 10 months or so. Uh, he had a he had a decent showing in the AFL. He finished 2022 uh, pretty strong at high A. So I think he's just kind of been making these these positive developments uh, and it just kind of keeps clicking and. Uh, at his size, I'd expect the strikeouts to trend up when he eventually gets to the majors. Like, I don't think Butler is a 18% strikeout rate guy against big league pitching. Um, but what he's shown with the 78% contact rate and that 90% K rate to me, like, I think, you know, I think I'd, I think I'd bet on him being a, at least, you know, being close to an everyday guy um you know he's got big power he's at least an above average runner uh he's he's been mostly playing center field he, he might end up in right field i think the defense should be fine and frankly you know oakland doesn't really have uh enough internal talent to relegate him to like dh or anything like that so uh lawrence butler yeah he's a you got a Got to scoop him up if he's still out there. Uh, Kale Loken says, how much power do you think Ignacio Alvarez can get to? Uh, I don't think he'll get to as much power as Vaughn Grissom as he climbs through the minors. Uh, I know Dylan White kind of compared the two guys. Uh, I think it like Alvarez, his strike zone discipline 
is even better than Von Grissom's. And I think there's less power there than there is with Grissom. Uh, and Alvarez has uh, the glove to at least, you know, I, I think if, if Von Grissom was as good of a defender as Alvarez is, he'd be playing shortstop um, for Atlanta right now. Um, so that part of it's nice with Alvarez that he's at least a, a quality defender. Uh, I'm treating him like where I ranked him, like towards the back of the top 200. I think he's going to be a single digit home run guy who could hit for a very high average with a high OBP and double digit steals. Uh, that's kind of his realistic upside to me. So I don't, I don't think Alvarez gets to, to much power at all. Uh, pancake pending of the Astros prospect risers, uh, Ryan Clifford, Jacob Melton, Drew Gilbert, Zach Dezenzo, uh, Dicenzo, uh, which two have the highest ceilings? Uh, Drew Gilbert, easily. Like, you know, I would take Drew Gilbert over the other three combined. Uh, he's a potential five category guy in Roto. Um, just can't say enough good things about Gilbert. Uh, I think I'll say Melton has the second highest ceiling of those guys. He's the only other one that's going to steal bases. And, you know, maybe he doesn't have quite as much power as Dicenzo, uh, maybe not quite as good of a approach or hit tool as Clifford, but I'll, I'll say that uh, Melton has the second most upside, but should be noted with all four of those guys that uh, high A Asheville, where a lot of them have done a lot of their damage is a very favorable hitting environment. Uh, Philip Sontag, any SP recommendations you believe will be, up and ready to contribute this year. So outside of the guys who've already gotten the call, uh, it's like Gavin Williams, Emmett Sheehan. Uh, if Andrew Painter or Ricky Tiedemann get healthy, um, may, I'm probably a little bit more worried about Tiedemann's health at this point than, than Painter's health, uh, especially since it's been like starts and stops with Tiedemann. Um, but if, if one of them get healthy, uh, Brian Wu, I'd probably throw into that mix of just guys I'd be excited about if they got the call. Uh, I'd be excited about Dio Hall if he got the call and it looked like he had made some progress with his control, but uh, he seemed to have maybe taken a slight step back there um, when I did this update. Uh, ben Brown and Andrew Abbott, they'll probably be up. I'm less bullish on them having a initial success. Um, so yeah, it's, if you're looking for impactful contributions on the SP side, Gavin Williams, Emmett Sheehan, Andrew Painter, maybe Brian Wu, um, that's pretty much it. Uh, Brandon says, uh, or asks, or maybe it's a statement. He says no Emerson Hancock. Um, Hancock was unranked coming into the year. He's walked 14 batters in 19 and a third innings in five May starts. And he's at a level where he made 21 starts last year. So uh, the highs have been higher with Hancock this year, I think, than they were last year. And there was a time in the process of putting together this update where I would have put Hancock probably on towards the back of the top 400. But uh, I haven't really seen anything to make me think he's more than a back end starter. Uh, Stephen Wasilko says, regarding James Wood, I was expecting a big rise in your ranks, top 10, possibly top 5. He was just promoted to double A. Is there something you don't like? Um, so Wood is uh, – I, I kind of compare Wood to like Jordan Lawler and Jason Dominguez. They're, they're his peers uh, from an age standpoint and an upside standpoint, and they're – They've been at double A all year. Wood just got the bump up there. If he perform or if he outperforms those guys at double A, then he'll he'll pass them for sure on the next update. Uh, I just don't, you know, I think over the next six, seven weeks or so between now and the next update, I expect Lawler and Dominguez to play better than Wood against double A pitching. But we'll we'll see how it goes. Uh if Lawler and Dominguez were at high A, I think their numbers would have been uh, perhaps better than James Woods. Uh, Catfish Paul, 
I traded Juan Soto in a 30-team dynasty, got Jordan Walker, Uri Perez, Termar Johnson, Logan Gilbert, and Edward Olivares. Did I get enough value back? So I would never advise anyone to do a five for one like this for a player like Soto. Uh, sure. Like you could, you could list five guys where it's like, Oh, of course you do that for Soto, but that's, that's not how it usually works for a guy like Juan Soto. Uh, I'm basically just kind of throwing out Olivares, Tamar Johnson. Those guys could end up helping you, but they're just, they're not valuable enough pieces to me to be, like don't let the other guy include them and count that as some sort of evening out of the trade package. It needs to be a two for one, maybe a three for one. That's as far as I'd go in the quantity over quality direction. Uh, you know, you want to be trading one Soto for Corbin Carroll. Uh, you want to be trading one Soto for, well, maybe you don't want to be, but like, you know, you get my point. Like Jordan Walker shouldn't be the headliner in a one Soto trade. <laughs> Uh, O's flows. Christian Robinson was reinstated, still just 22. Any excitement? Uh, I'm I'm very excited for for Robinson being back and playing in games. Uh, I'm really, you know, more so. I'm just really happy for Christian Robinson. Uh, I think he got a bit of a raw deal. Uh, was he was a kid? He, he was on. Un, he was under the influence. He made a mistake. Uh, you know, there's plenty of kids who. <laughs> at that age uh make a mistake um and if you know he wasn't from the u.s so he suffered harsher consequences than he otherwise would i, I think it would be a great story if he reestablished himself this season but he's not going to be you know, he's kind of fighting an uphill battle and he's not going to be at an age appropriate level till he gets to double a so i it would be such a fun story if christian robinson just dominated at single a got to bump to high a and then forced another promotion at double a like that that would be so much fun and i hope it happens um alex washburn it seems like you're a buyer of sebastian walcott could you explain why uh walcott uh the top j15 guy for the rangers uh, he's from the bahamas uh, he's got the best combination of power and speed upside and combined with reviews on his hit tool uh, from that class, uh, you know, I, I rely on like Ben Badler of Baseball America for, for a lot of this stuff. Um, and it, it seems like Walcott might be just like a touch ahead of Felon and Celestine from a, a hit tool standpoint right now. Uh, of course, you know, we throw all the reports out the window after, you know, four, six weeks worth of games and stuff, but um just based on the reports i've seen i think walcott is the guy from that class just a, a hair over celestine after ethan solace um and i'm just i'm keeping walcott in the in the range where i think taking a flyer on a guy with zero pro experience makes some sense there and his value could skyrocket um uh, his value could trend way down uh, but i think it's it's worthwhile uh, just outside the top 100 uh, John Brasca says Everson Pereira is improving his K rate and contributing in all categories, but he didn't move in your rankings and got jumped by a number of guys. What stopped you from moving him up the ranks? Uh, Pereira is basically just doing what he did last year at double a. So to me, his value is just kind of holding steady. Uh, if he, you know, if he had, so a dozen guys probably graduated ahead of him. And then, you know, 10 guys or so behind him who are really improving their stock, uh, jump past him, you know, like, uh, I think like uh, AJ Smith Shaver jumps past him and Emma Sheehan jumps past him. You know, that leaves Pereira moving up, uh, just two spots from 44 to 42. Uh, so just, I don't, in my mind, nothing's really changed about Pereira. Um, I still like him a lot. I'm sure I probably still have him ranked uh, higher than most people. Uh, J3KDF, what's your peak for Christian Encarnacion Strand look like? Is he Kyle Schwarber with less power to you? Uh, I think he, I think he could be Jake Berger 2.0. Uh, 
uh, which I mean, I mean that as a compliment. Like I love Jake Berger. Uh, you know, CES uh, has probably just as much power potential as Kyle Schwarber, especially if you factor in Great American Ballpark. And uh, the difference, though, uh, pretty obviously, is that Pete Kyle Schwarber was an OBP machine. And Encarnacion Strand has a walk rate below 5% since getting traded to Cincinnati. So uh, power, very similar to Schwarber. Um, but the approach, the patience, just very different. Uh, Corey B3P, who would you pick up if all were available? Xavier Isaac, Blaze Jordan, Jordan Beck, Sebastian Walcott. Uh, I'd pick up Isaac uh, for the reasons I mentioned earlier in the show. But I think you can make a case for Jordan Beck with the Rockies if you really don't want to wait three years for Isaac. John Vaki, uh, your list came out when Nick Frasso was sidelined. He's at 187, 187 and has done nothing but shove all year. Was your rank related to health at the time? If he shows no ill effects to the time off, where does he land? Uh, there's basically nothing Frasso could have done in the first six weeks realistically to shoot up the rankings. His stuff is excellent. It's uh, really, really good stuff. He showed that last year. The big thing with Frasso, I've said this plenty of times. I wrote it in his outlook. He hasn't thrown more than 60 innings in a season dating back to his freshman year at Loyola Marymount in 2018. I, I don't know if he ever threw more than 60 innings uh, before getting to Loyola Marymount, but this is a long track record here of this guy just being unable to build up past that, that marker. And so uh, we need to see him build up the innings to actually buy into him being a starting pitcher. Uh, I would have him ranked on the top 400, even if we just knew for a fact he was a reliever only. He, the stuff is that good. The, he's a strikeout machine. Uh, I have confidence that he would be a strikeout machine in a relief role in the big leagues. Uh, so I would have him ranked even if he was just definitely a reliever. And I think there's you know 90% chance he's a reliever, uh, maybe even 95% chance long term. But uh, Frasso pitching well, like that's not new. He did that last year. Uh, we need to see him show that he can handle a starter's workload. B Steph 12. What's up with George Valera? Still a chance? Question uh, mark. There's definitely still a chance. He's been a bit snake bit by injuries this year, uh, wrist and now a hamstring. Um, he's 22. He's at Triple A, so plenty of time to get things on track. Um, and it also it works in his favor, I think, George Valera, that Will Brennan and Oscar Gonzalez have kind of failed to take uh, the outfield job and, and run with it. So if Valera gets healthy and performs well at AAA, maybe he gets uh, a run as kind of a, a regular for, for Cleveland in the second half. Uh, Mike says, does Landon Knack get lost in the shuffle or a bit buried as you can only rank so many Dodgers pitching prospects highly? When do you think Knack and or Sheehan get moved up to Oklahoma City? Uh, it's a bit telling to me that Knack is still at double A, despite the fact he's pitched very well and turns 26 in July. Uh, you know, if they were to rush him, if they were to rush one of those guys to the majors this year, I think Sheehan makes more sense since he has way better stuff. Uh, Knack is kind of more of a pitchability and command type of guy. Uh, I, I know he did. He's he kind of had a bad body. Uh, I might still have a little bit of a bad body, but I know that was like a big thing they, they stressed in the off season was like, he's got to get in better shape. And I think he's probably done that, uh, especially just given the, the results at double a, but you know, he's about to turn 26 and uh, I, I think both those guys get the bump to triple a maybe within the next month or so. Uh, John Snyder says Colt Keith is a higher rated prospect than Justin Henry Malloy. But Keith is in double A and Malloy is in triple A and Keith is surging with Malloy slumping. Could we actually see Keith leapfrog Malloy to the majors this year, given how bad the Tigers third base slash DH situation is? Uh, I wouldn't completely rule it out. Keith is definitely the better prospect of the two. 
that's just not generally the way things go with rebuilding clubs. Uh, you know, rebuilding clubs, you know, what's, what's the incentive to rush Keith over Malloy to the big leagues, even if Keith's Keith's a better long-term player, I'm sure they realize that, but Malloy, Malloy has 72 more games under his belt in the upper levels of the minors. And Malloy might be slumping a little bit, but he's still been one of the best age appropriate hitters in the international league this year. So, uh, I don't see them. I don't see them adding Colt Keith to the 40 man roster this season. Chase sweeper. You should take a deeper look at Trey McLaughlin in the Mets org. Uh, I did take a look and, uh, he's a, he's an interesting reliever, uh, at high a, he went to driveline this winter. Um, He's also about to turn 24, and he's still hasn't pitched at Double A. So uh, I took a look, Chase, and he's on he's on my radar now, but not a top 400 guy. Uh, my name is Jeff. asks Why is Dominic Canzone Canzone Canzone? I'm not sure. Um, why is he unranked? Uh, he's in he's in the Diamondbacks org. Uh, he's been in the mix on my personal Diamondback sheet for years. I'm sure he's been kind of on and off their top 20. Uh, he was 21st, but I just added him to the top 20 with Dre Jamison graduating. Uh, but at this point, I think Ken Zone looks like a quadruple A hitter. Uh, we're kind of talking about that idea with uh, Aaron Shunk earlier in the show. Ken Zone really kind of checks all the boxes for quad A hitter, which essentially if you haven't heard that term before, it basically means you repeat triple a and you just keep getting better at triple a, but every time you get a shot in the big leagues, you just fall flat. Like that's kind of what I would expect from Ken zone. Uh, plus the diamondbacks already have guys like Alec Thomas, Dominic Fletcher, Jorge Barosa. Uh, those guys are all at triple a. They can actually provide some defensive value. So I don't know how Ken zone gets a look, uh, or like a legit look over those guys. Um, and Ken Zone's the worst defender of, of the bunch. Um, so, yeah, I think he's just a quad A guy. Uh, maybe he proves me wrong, but not going to get added to the top 400 based on what he's doing at AAA. Uh, Bob May, where would Oswald Peraza rank if he were still prospect eligible? What are your What is your current MLB projections for him? Uh, I'd have Peraza ranked around 20th overall, I think. Uh, so just behind the top pitchers, um, you know, guys like Painter and Sheehan, uh, I think I'd have Peraza like ahead of uh, Marcelo Meyer. Um, but yeah, uh, so definitely top 25, maybe top 20. And then in terms of my projection for Peraza, uh, I, I still think it, it's it's kind of you hope that he's the the good version of Andres Jimenez, like basically what Andres Jimenez did last year, where it's pretty close to twenty twenty, good batting average, uh, less good OBP, so batting average over OBP for Peraza. But he could have a he could have a handful of twenty twenty seasons. I really like Peraza. Okay, that's going to do it uh, for the Q&A. Uh, as always, brought to you by Rival Fantasy. And as I said, next week I will be previewing the Rookie Leagues. So stay tuned for that. <laughs>